Okay, we're good. We're good. Yeah. All right. Um, hi, everybody, uh, and welcome to Design and Dialogue. Um, today, we have the privilege of welcoming uh, Alex um, Groves from Studio Swine. His partner, Azusa, um, will not be joining us today, but, but we recognize her, uh, as well as their new baby, who we might hear in the background. Congratulations, <laughs> Alex. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's good to see you, man. It's been a while. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's good to see you. <laughs> um, yeah, it's probably the first time we've seen anyone. Um, <laughs> like, it's been, uh, we've been locked down in Tokyo and um, it's just been, uh, yeah, three of us. Yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. Is it a boy or a girl? It's a little girl. Oh, congratulations. That's wonderful. What's her name? Uh, Amelie, but we call her Amachan. Ame Amachan. is like in Japanese is rain. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. Uh, that's super sweet. Um, so uh, congratulations on Amachan. And also, I guess it's 10 years of Studio Swine now, right? So, it is. Yeah. Yeah, It's a it's decade years, for you yeah. guys. So you have another milestone to uh, to be proud of. Yeah. Once again. We can retire now. That's yeah. what <laughs> um, when did you relocate uh, to Tokyo? I know you were based in London for a while. Yeah, October 2019. Okay. Um, so we came out here for um, uh, to do a project because we quite like to be hands on and on the ground. And um, then, um, yeah, everything happens, global events having a baby, everything. Yeah. So uh, I'm happily stuck here. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, should we assume that Azusa has roots there and her family is there? Yeah, um, Azusa is from um, Nagoya, which okay. is like a big industrial city. And okay. Okay. Yeah. Of course, I spent some time in Japan. Um, I lived in Tokyo when I was in grad school for a few months. Oh, nice. Yeah, and my first trip out of the country was actually to Osaka. So, uh, oh wow! And I've been to Kyoto, but that's that's about it. And Yokohama. That must have been really formative in your kind of whole design. Oh yeah, career, I imagine. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's still, I gotta say, it's still one of my favorite cities. Um, I just yeah. love. It's fascinating because it's such a peaceful place. It's it's yeah, such a big city, but but quite homogenous culturally speaking, and so absolutely. somehow everything just seems to work and flow and and uh, put you at ease. It's you know, it's really a a phenomenon it's kind of yeah the <laughs> tranquility is incredible and when you go out on a walk in the evenings and they don't have the kind of big street lights illuminating the streets that you get like or, as you know all these little roads and it, it's very dark and very very quiet and the cars are kind of largely electric so you don't it's so kind of quiet and tranquil peaceful mm -hmm. um and um it, yeah i really um i love that the, the mood it has in the evenings yeah. and it suddenly makes it much more attractive because you know as you know it's like a lot of kind of really ugly concrete buildings they're just much <laughs> they kind of kind of soften and disappear into the shadows and you get these little lanterns and kind of uh, pools of light um yeah it is about the scale of the buildings the scale of the architecture the scale of the streets the the urban fabric mm. right the, the built environment in, in Tokyo is quite in Japan is quite particular you know mm. if I remember correctly but you mentioned you were there for a project and I know that you guys travel it's sort of your modus operandi right your your way of working is to kind of relocate for a project um, yeah do you want to um, tell us a little bit about what you were doing out there yeah I mean actually the project um that we're doing here I can't reveal yet because it's um and not been launched and, and and it's for a client that but um that kind of method of it used to be our modus operandi now we've got um a baby that's kind of changed and we're, we're looking at the next 10 years being very different to the last 10 years um but yeah right from the get-go out of college we um just love getting out of our comfort zone and moving somewhere new new and so yeah. we straight out of college you know we graduated in london it was like super um i mean they have more graduates than anywhere in the world i, I imagine and, and you're kind of 
it, we'd been there a long time before then as well. And so we moved to Sao Paulo and we didn't know anyone and, and we just kind of um, up sticks and, and moved and went there for six months and then a further um, six months. And um, yeah, it just allows us to see the world in a different way. Um, totally. Kind of completely changes um, our perception and what's possible as well. It makes us kind of uh, approach work differently. And we ended up doing a project we never would have done in London, which was Kansas City. Um, um, and making I'm, a not, I'm really not sure what, <laughs> which, which of your many projects are you going to be sharing with us tonight? Um, oh, yeah. Before we jump right in, I mean, I, I won't, I won't, uh, I'll spare us all uh, the question about uh, the name Studio Swine. And uh, <laughs> I'd love to go back to the beginning though, when you were both, um, I'm assuming you met at the Royal College since you both graduated there. Yeah. Um, but, but maybe you could tell us about what attracted you to each other professionally. Um, what was it that you felt you had in common and, and what, uh, how the Royal College sort of contributed to uh, your point of view at the time? Um, yeah, I'd say that maybe the interesting thing for us is we wouldn't have necessarily like, like been attracted to each other professionally and, and chosen to work with each other because we, we didn't, I, I wouldn't say that we're like, um, uh, I mean, we, we started dating and we kind of, um, uh, a couple obviously, um, uh, and then we started just interfering with each other's projects and kind of, <laughs> or I'd interfere with the Zeus's, she would help me massively because I found I was, I found the RCA like a very, I was not a good student and I found it very difficult. I'd come from fine art and I, I found the, um, it, it kind of far too like, um, uh, like um, what's it called when you're told what to do, um, kind of cons Training and talk, talk to and all these kind of things, and um, she found that the absolute opposite should come from architecture and experience, like much more serious, rigorous kind of um, uh, yeah, Spartan um, teaching, and she found it like, incredibly free, and um, so she helped me out enormously. And on my kind of graduate projects, she was, she was in the year above, but. Um, when I ended up graduating, we did Sea Chair and the beginning of her highway, basically. Okay, okay. And um, yeah, it kind of just worked. Um, we both end up making a work together that we, neither of us would have got to on our own. Hmm. And um, all the work comes from like a, just a lot of debate and kind of um, trying to understand each other, basically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow, super interesting. So, so um, I know you're going to be sharing some images with us. Should we just jump right into that? Sure. Uh, and start, I guess, at the beginning. That's a good place to start. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, I'll, uh, let me just. This is um, Ford Langer. And actually, when we graduated from college and um, we went out to Sao Paulo and we ended up doing a project called Can City. Um, just like this mobile aluminium foundry on the street using waste um, materials um, and melting them down into this kind of vernacular objects on the, on the streets. Um, and I won't show you that, this is like jumping years ahead to 2015. We'd, we'd kind of done a few of these, what we call a venture project where we'd, we'd been out to Shanghai we'd, and done mm -hmm. Hair Highway. We'd, uh, we'd been a few places and we've been across the Atlantic on a boat and made stuff with sea plastic and this is our kind of like it was all uh, leading to this kind of Ford Langer point we'd heard about this city when we're in Sao Paulo we'd heard about this city in the jungle that was quite mysterious it was like an American town all made of wood wooden houses but really like Cape Cod style um, made by Henry Ford for his motor car industry. And it was just this mysterious, like elusive idea that had always kind of played in our mind of that sounding quite exciting. Um, and we, we kind of returned to the project because we didn't really have a reason to go there other than that it sounded really cool and, and you know, be great. But um, 
there wasn't something that drew us there to what would we make there and um it was really that we were in a we we're researching another project in an old tobacconist in london we we're doing this series of benches and one was based on the craft of pipes and the mouthpiece on this pipe was like this black polished material oh. and um we were like this is um i mean we we're used to the feel of plastics because we kind of go onto beaches and like sort plastic and you can kind of get a feel for what type is what and so we know plastic very well and we could tell this wasn't plastic and it wasn't something we'd come across before it wasn't lack aware but it had this kind of warmth to it it was mm. Anyway, there's ebonite and we researched more into ebonite and then that got us researching into rubber and the amazing material that rubber is and the whole kind of environment or like aspects of that, both good and bad. Um, ebonite and ebonite uh, comes from uh, rubber, right? It's a, it's yeah. through a process of heating rubber, I believe. Uh, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, ebonite is like heat and pressure and a bit of sulfur and a bit of linseed oil and it makes the, it totally transforms the material into this kind of very dense very hard um polished material that used to be like a precursor to plastic so there used to be a lot made in ebonite like all the old black telephones were ebonite because it's very insulating for electricity so, um, so it's very useful for that like car batteries were ebonite. So that's actually why car batteries are black today. I mean, car batteries are now encased in plastic, which they dye black to look like ebonite because <laughs> in our head we associate like car batteries should be black. Um, <laughs> but ebonite and, has a certain weight to it, right? I mean, so this is yeah. kind of one of the reasons you can tell it from plastic because it's much heavier per, uh, I guess, ounce, I suppose. It, one of the things that, uh, yeah, there's a bit, mis it doesn't feel yeah, I guess it depends on what object and how it's used. Um, you're probably, it is much denser than plastic, yeah. Um, it's warmer to the touch and um, it's got a nice mouth feel, which um, uh, is important for like saxophone mouth, mouthpieces um, mm -hmm. or smoking pipes. It doesn't have any taste and um, it's um, just got a lovely like tactile kind of quality to it. Um, yeah. And then you also use it for fountain pens. So at the moment, it's like it's still used, but it's very, very niche, like saxophone mm -hmm. mouthpieces, fountain pens. Uh, they use it in the oil industry because it comes from because it's made from natural rubber and not from petroleum. It doesn't get dissolved or degraded by uh, whatever they use in the oil industry. So mm -hmm. they use it like in industrially, which is why the, like the last few is like we visited two factories and there's probably only three left in the whole world. So, so is there a link between Fordlandia, which I believe was 1923 or around that time and, and Ebonite? I mean, was Ford producing Ebonite? He wasn't producing Ebonite. He was, he built this um, town to get um, just natural rubber for his automobiles like all the kind of the tires and he had vertical integration in the company so ford motor car owned like mines they owned forests for the wood they they owned shipping companies they owned everything and they wanted they um what had happened to the rubber industry is that um it used to only come from the amazon because um uh, it's the only place the tree is native and they used to it used to and, and it couldn't be grown um in plantations, it had to be in the wild forest. So they had these people, uh, rubber tappers, living out in the forest, tapping rubber. And then you had these rubber barons that were in the Amazon at Manaus. And they were so stinking rich because of this monopoly on rubber that yeah. they would get their, like the, the, they'd get their laundry done in Lisbon, in Portugal. And, and <laughs> or they'd, <laughs> they'd like, um, you know, use, hundred dollar bills to light their cigars and have champagne fountains and all this kind of it just it was one of the richest places in the world uh, for the very few um uh so tell us about your entry point then into the fordlandia project yeah so basically we got interested in this ebonite and um then we found out about wild rubber because what happened is basically um an english naturalist went to the amazon collected loads of seeds um they, they say that he stole them, but 
uh, Kew Gardens when I researched it said that's absolutely not the case. You got all the permits to it. You know, it's one of those mythologies they stole them. He actually kind of exported them legally. And he basically propagated them in Kew Gardens. Then they sent them out to the British Empire, to places like Southeast Asia, where it's not a native plant. And because you don't have the pests and diseases and all those things that, um, that, it, that it's in its native environment, you can intensively plantation farm it. And it just changed the whole rubber industry. And the, this, the these kind of rubber barons overnight, like their, their industry was lost and it's much more efficient to kind of grow it on scale in Southeast Asia. And that's where we get our rubber from today. And we don't get it from the Amazon. Um, the Amazon's operating at like less than 2% of its capacity to grow rubber. Um, and it becomes something to be proud of uh, for the British, but <laughs> another one to talk up to the British Empire. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's just um, that, uh, yeah, I, I find it fascinating because we still rely on it so much and um, the, the rubber, not the British Empire. Um, and <laughs> so <laughs> basically, like, uh, it's still something that there's the demand for natural rubber is still massive and growing each year and you know we've invented synthetic rubbers since the second world war um but they're not as good like when you got an airplane the tires on an airplane are 80 percent natural rubber uh, surgeons gloves condoms formula one cars anything that really requires like supreme performance yeah. Yeah. is natural rubber mm. um and so at the moment it's like hugely damaging because it's grown in southeast asia they can clear a lot of forests to make mono plantations of this uh, crop mm. but um the the wild rubber is a kind of a project by kind of uh wwf and they've got great people like lily cole um involved and it's really looking at rubber being grown in the Amazon in the wild forest and they can get more for a kilo of latex than a kilo of beef. And so it's like looking at how you can make a sustainable economy around the forest just remaining wild. And, and rubber is just one of the products, there's, there's many. So I mean, and so that's orange point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I guess when I think about the way that you work, um, it's been described by, um, by both of you as, as a kind of gonzo journalism, right? This, yeah, this this idea of uh, being first person and uh, somehow being critical of the existing system while also documenting what you find um, has been very integral to your approach um, toward design. Yeah, absolutely. And, and really, it's like that's come about through necessity, because whenever we've looked into a new material, um, uh, we found that online research just doesn't go far enough. It's just not been, uh, there's just not enough information online. Um, and it's quite hard to obtain the materials. So we actually end up having to go there and, uh, and that all becomes part of the story. You're kind of pulling on a thread that leads you back to where things come from. And um, so that's right from the beginning with sea plastic. Uh, I mean, now it's widely known and there's lots of information online, but back 10 years ago it wasn't really the public consciousness and there was a few scientific papers and things but the, the, we had to go to the beaches and research it ourselves and go out to see and find it ourselves and just to source the material actually to do something with it and see what's possible same with this with wild rubber it's really hard to get hold of and um we end up uh yeah uh, going to the Amazon and, and then also making sure that we wanted to visit Fort Landra and make a whole story about that. So um, this is what Fort Landra looks like today, actually. And it's still got the big factory in the center of the town. Um, and it's still kind of, it's like a, they've dropped tools in the 1930 and it's kind of just left there. It's quite amazing. Um, and this is hundreds of miles into the Amazon rainforest. Yeah. And it's, it's really quite far to the nearest big city, right? Yeah. Um, we had to fly to Manaus and then take a smaller plane to Santarém. And then it was like up the Rio Negro for about um, 12 hours and um, on boats on this kind of... Uh, they look like, a bit like Mississippi paddle steamers. But anyway. Um, mm. And then um 
uh, when we went to visit the rubber tappers, that was even further in. I mean, we the road was only just opened after the rain and we had to get a four by four and we we're traveling for like 16 hours or so. wow. <laughs> four by four. And wow. yeah, um, it was quite, a, yeah, the only, the only way in for the last bit was by cow. <laughs> like, um, actually Indian breed of cows that um, they load up with stuff. And, There's so, yeah. so many questions, Alex. I mean, um, this is quite luxurious in a way for the two of you to go to such a remote place. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it was. It, it, I mean, it's so fortunate, but it's like uh, the reason why we did it so many years after hearing about it is it just takes so many years to get all your ducks in a row to kind of try and get the funding together um which you apply to lots of different places for that and it just yeah it's a i mean there's the idea stage as i'm sure you, you find as well is, is the ver very small part of your time so much of it is all the yeah, yeah. how you get it done how you get it done absolutely yeah. So I'd, I'd love to hear more about that, but let's um, please show us uh, what you found. Yeah, I mean, this is actually on the road to um, uh, when we're visiting the rubber tappers. It's in, um, uh, on the border of Bolivia and they were burning the forest at the time. And um, it's just this uh, kind of apocalyptic scenes when you go along the road and the forest is light and it's the only illumination because it's so, uh, there's, nothing else around and just the fizzing and popping and cracking of the of the forest um it was really we stopped and filmed it and we're still working on the um film actually um but that was clearing land for um cattle um so it's just kind of really um, yeah brought so and and since we've done this project obviously we were already aware of how bad the problem is getting um yeah this is um the when we're with the rubber tappers at the top that's actually a hot rod meet that we went to as another part of the <laughs> research because yeah. <laughs> yeah. we're interested in like these ford motor cars and the whole history of hot rods but um yeah these rubber tappers they go up like really early in the morning and they visit about um a hundred different trees it takes them six hours and they put a cup under each one and and kind of score the bark and they, it very slowly drips into a cup, and then when they come back around after the, the, they collect all the cups, and um, yeah, that was incredible staying with them. How did you um, come into contact with them, and and how many? When you say them, uh, what, what size is a community like this working? Yeah, so um, this was through uh, WWF that kindly like put us in touch with the rubber uh, rubber tappers um, in Acre State and the world um, wildlife federation yeah and um so um they had a person in rio branco that we met up with and and mm. could um give us a contact for the rubber tappers and um we went out and they lived as a family on a kind of ranch like um like a small farm but um it had forests all around and um where they tapped the rubber and um, there's about 25 people in the house and all sleeping in hammocks. It's quite kind of, uh, when Azusa was there, she said it's not unlike a Japanese house. It's like yeah. raised off the ground, these kind of, it's really minimalist because they have the hammocks up in the day and then they all disappear a bit like, um, you know, it's your futons. The, it's the tropical conditions, right? That they, they yeah themselves from the ground. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, yeah, you've got, uh, yeah, exactly. And you've got, they've got chickens kind of running around under the house eating the insects and things. So it's like, um, but funny enough, not under, we were staying in like their schoolroom and there wasn't any chickens under us. And these huge spiders would come out every night and um, <laughs> they're just huge. And they just sat there they just, under your hammocks. But you really had to shake your shoes because they were absolutely uh, massive. And it's where you get the Brazilian wandering spider that, gives you like, I don't know, four hours and to live and there's no phone reception. <laughs> so, but it, it was all good. We, we asked the kid there, like, oh, are they, um, uh, are they dangerous? And he's like, yeah, they're dangerous, but they won't bite you, you know? 
(laughs) (laughs) You have to know how to handle them, I suppose. (laughs) So, So, Alex, give us a sense of what, I mean, if you don't mind me asking quite directly, what was the purpose, really, besides the documentation? Is it purely a journalistic exercise or... What what is it that you're looking for in a project? Oh, we yeah, I mean I, it's it is that as well. That's a major part of it um, because we always see the work as a kind of vehicle for um, telling a story about the world, understanding the world. So it's kind of like a piece of journalism mm. and a product at the end of it. Um, but also, it was at, in this case, it was actually to get hold of the world rubber. We just needed to get. Um, uh, the rubber itself, and we also wanted to understand the process behind it and, and um, mm. everything. So um, the, the thing is that rubber is like an incredibly kind of humble material. It makes like it's beige. It makes rubber bands and gloves yeah. and things like that. And it's people don't care about the providence of it. Um, mm. And this wild rubber is naturally more expensive than something that's been kind of intensively. Uh, is part of industrial agriculture on a mono plantation and how would you raise the value of it to reflect that if it was just kind of making rubber bands i don't think that um that's gonna work basically so in that way we had to tell the story and also understand where it comes from um to make people care about so, so and then what- elevate it through other ways yeah, I mean, yeah. I suppose the, the next question has to be, what is the purpose of elevating the, the price of this rubber if only 2% is coming from the rainforest at this point? Well, a lot more could be coming from the rainforest. And so these rubber tappers, for example, they can make more for um, a kilo of latex, which is the, the liquid that comes out of the tree, um, than a kilo of beef. So mm. if you could create if you could increase demand for Amazonian rubber, you would be basically paying people to be custodians of the wild forest and um, make a sustainable industry around the Amazon. So rather than just see it as like a kind of, um, the Amazon is so much more valuable, wild and alive and and how it is than than for soybean or cattle and, at the moment, the economy is saying, no, it's more valuable for soybean and cattle because we haven't really explored or developed those um, economies around it being sustained as a wild forest, basically. Um, but there's lots of things like acai is grown in a wild forest, Brazil nuts grown in wild forest. Um, I mean, it's the large, I, I believe it's, it's one of the largest concentrations of biodiversity. Uh, in the world. Yeah, 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 and there's so many medicines and everything that, you want, sure. that are yet to be discovered. Um, Did you, I mean, I know that, I mean, myself, when I've traveled and worked in, in remote places in the world, um, I'm going with uh, a set of concerns in mind, like much like yourself, but, but without a product necessarily. The product kind of evolves from the process and i wonder about your work were you were you going here with a product in mind because you you said you were looking for the rubber so you were, you had a you had a product concept in mind what what was that yeah yeah um i mean we had it was more that we had a material in mind that was uh, we'd seen ebonite and then we'd learned about wild rubber and then we kind of and we knew about fort and we could see how all these things could interconnect into a project and so rubber is quite a difficult, difficult thing to work with um, because, you know, yeah, you think about it's fantastic utilitarian functions, but it's, but then once you change it into ebonite, it opens up a world of possibilities. You've got this material that's as dense and tough as teak and, mm. you know, uh, exotic hardwoods that you couldn't or wouldn't use now, but um, you could kind of make you could get something from the sustainable forest like that. So that's, um, we didn't have a kind of finished product in mind, but we very much had, oh, we want to make ebonite from the sustainable rubber source. Um, with the point of view of, of uh, reaching the luxury market with the product. Yeah, exactly. Um, hmm. Yeah, so this is like, um, this is the ebonite factory. This one actually is in Japan and um, 
they mainly make these um, fountain pens and like uh, mouthpieces for clarinets there or saxophones uh, yeah. or something. Um, and they, uh, and so, yeah, um, it was really um, thinking about how to do that with wild rubber. And then this is the material actually from a ebonite factory in Germany. Um, wow. And they can make these, they make marbleized kind of beautiful colors with natural kind of um, pigments. And yeah. Um, Does the material have, I mean, can you speak a little bit about its, uh, its, uh, its performance in terms of, uh, you know, reproducing the feel of something like teak or the, you know, an exotic hardwood. I mean, does it, does it perform in a similar way? Um, can it be thermoformed, I wonder? Uh, yeah. Yeah, we were, um, yeah, it can be thermoformed. You can put it in hot water, basically. We have these big ban maries, um, like the type that you get in the kind of, I don't know, Chinese restaurant um, in the food hot. And we can put the rods in there and then we put them in a wooden jig and we just kind of bend them into shape. And it's a very tough thing to bend, but it keeps its shape really well once it's bent. And it Almost can be like turned on a lathe. Steam bending wood, I suppose. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. But much easier than wood, actually. And then it's um, it can be turned on a lathe. It can be polished. It can be kind of machined in very much the same way that you'd machine hardwood yeah. and we love like tropical modernist design from uh, you know um brazil that was something that we really fell in love with when we're in sao paulo and some of those forms they're only possible because they use these hardwoods i mean it was back in the 50s or what have you different worlds but they use these hardwoods of, uh, that now Sergio um, rodriguez and and uh, is that, yeah yeah joaquin teniero and yeah uh, uh, just <laughs> I'm trying to think of the, the, the third guy who worked uh, who worked principally in wood, um, who always slips my mind. But did you hear that Lina Bobardi was just awarded uh, at the Venice uh, Biennale for a kind of lifetime achievement award? Uh, oh, that's after. fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, no, I didn't think that. Yeah. yeah. No, I love that. I love um, the when one culture takes kind of another culture and it makes it its own. And so you like tropical modernism like that, taking that Scandinavian or that kind of European modernist style and giving it that Brazilian kind of huh. low lounge seating and kind of sen right. sensuous right. forms. Right. Very different um, posture. Yeah. Hugo Franca. I was thinking of Hugo Franca. Oh, he's fantastic. Yeah, I love his yeah. benches in the park. And all. So, so you were making furniture with this. Uh, yeah. Ebonite. And so this was like a, uh, the first piece that we made, and um, uh, you and we used like some of the language of the um, uh, tropical modernists, the way they use kind of woven kind of cane seating, mm. which is a kind of hangover from colonial style. Yeah. but really practical in kind of tropical climates and um yeah um what else there's oh, this is quite, there's something oh, quite japanese about that also somehow maybe yeah, I mean, the, maybe it's the black but but it, it reminds me almost of uh of uh the lacquerware somehow right like the yeah highly polished black form yeah and just like tapering down mm -hmm. um yeah, um, this is um, a, a kind of rubber tapper knife that we made, but we made this with, um, that's ebonite handle, um, but the the blade is actually a kind of aluminium bronze that we went to um, a, a place that makes car parts. Um, it's like a small sand casting um, place actually near where I live in UK. And they have this alloy there that's just beautiful and it's aluminium bronze and it's incredibly hard and they use it for kind of clutches. But they have like these little puddles of it where they've scraped off the impurities at the top of a crucible and kind of poured it on the sand before they pour the mold. And we were collecting these kind of puddles and then making them into the knives. So it's still the language of automobiles, like this would have been a clutch, but it's a, a knife that's kind of got all the... Um, so really, I mean, it's 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 almost as if you're telling stories through the objects, right? 
Absolutely. Yeah. The, the story we want to tell is that we went there actually with a kind of, we'd writ, uh, read um, Greg Grandan's brilliant book on Fordlandia and um, uh, the, it's like a, people love to think Fordlandia is a kind of huge failure of, of human kind of arrogance and hubris in the face of um, nature. And it is that story, but there's more to it actually. Like that Henry Ford, you know, he, he did have um, a lot of vision and he grew up on a farm and he really believed the future was agriculture and industry yeah. kind of merging. And he made the first, like, he used to, he was a vegan, he used to serve mm -hmm. his guests like soya based food um, from <laughs> starter to dessert and Incredible. wear a soybean fiber suit and he kind of created the first plastic car that was much lighter like during the second world war when there's shortages on metal he made this plastic car out of soybean um, and it was stronger and lighter and all these kind of qualities so he was quite visionary and he, the Ford Lander was a huge failure and, and you know um, but um, we were kind of interested in what if it had succeeded and mm. Henry Ford had said that like a business that makes nothing but money is a poor business and mm. yeah we're always interested in like going forward how can nature and culture kind of be have a more symbiotic relationship yeah I'm curious because this is one of the few projects although it's quite extensive in its kind of scholarly research it's one of the few projects that I've seen of yours where I, there there isn't an associated film, and and I, I was happy to hear that you're well you're working on the film <laughs> because yeah. I'm I'm curious how your studio you know as you said and yourself um, work with a large collective of uh, you know film producers directors cinematographers etc. Mm -hmm. to produce a film that. Um, you know, is very uh, unique in the kind of design industry, right? A film uh, for telling a story about a process, a project, a product, um, a way of making something. So can you tell us a little bit about the role that film plays in your work and, and how that came to be? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, we the, the films, um, I mean, actually we, very fortunate to work with two brilliant film directors, Yuri Amboy and Peter Kretschy. And, and um, so for different films, we, um, one of them. And, and so um, Ford Langer, Yuri Amboy came up with us. And so it was just him and a camera and, and it wasn't a big crew. Um, and um, I mean, we, Azusa and I kind of act as crew and do what we can. Um, but we've always been really interested in film. Um, I mean, we'd love the design films of Charles and Ray Eames, and for us, they still stand up as like the best, you know, <laughs> design films that I, I ever made. They're just it's so incredible. Um, and I feel like that it, to us, it it's we don't really separate between this is the object, this is the film, this is we see it all as kind of an integrated whole. And so we've always designed the film from the beginning. Um, and storyboarded it and kind of, um, and it's kind of led this the approach and it, it, it's, um, yeah, it's something that can go to many, many people. Uh, they often don't have any um, spoken words, so they're totally like um, borderless. Well, this is, and, um, yeah. this is this is quite another question. I'm, I'm curious about the audience for your, your films. I mean, I wonder, um, I mean, unlike, Charles and Ray Eames, right? They they were um, they were making films for themselves, I guess, in some way that then got repackaged and redistributed. And some of the films were made for science, some of the films were made for clients. But but I wonder how what, who who is the audience? Let's say um, Alex for for a film like Forlandia, where does that end up? Who sees that? Yeah, well, we've always seen the most important exhibitions being online. And so I guess the audience is no different from the other films that when we started, our first film was Sea Chair. And um, we just wanted to tell the story of sea plastic and, and um, huh. get people seeing where things come from or where things go or, or what have you. And um, they just, we put them on Vimeo and we kind of push it out there and we use like design platforms to kind of 
present it, you know, but then it it enters the internet and it become, you know, it has its own path that you can't part, pay, uh, pay for. And they end up going to like National Geographic. We've had quite a lot of films go to National Geographic um, and Discovery Channel and all kinds of places. And uh, that's the fantastic thing about the, you know, um, putting something out there on these kind of platforms. They just uh, it can reach people that you wouldn't be able to even think about reaching otherwise. Um, and they're often like go to National Geographic because it's the first time anyone's filmed there, like the Hair Highway Project. Similarly, we couldn't find anything online about human hair or any kind of really interesting footage or anything from these hair markets. So we had to kind of go there ourselves to discover it. And then it ended up being the first time that was filmed. And then, you know, so um, this Ford Landry became, the reason why the film is quite a few years delayed is because, um, the projects kind of, they were so simple to begin with, like Sea Chair and Can City. And it's like one simple story of how you're making a chair from waste on the streets of Sao Paulo or from plastic or sea or whatever. This kind of got such a, the, the, the stories got so complex in Fordlandia. There's a whole history of Fordlandia. There's the whole story of rubber. There's the whole, what is Evernight? There's everything. And you're trying to do it without words. And you've got you know, we did so many days shooting in the Amazon and Evernight factories, like hot rod shows, wherever in the uh, UK. And it just became really like a monster. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> broke our ability for like the format that we normally use of not having a script and, you know, trying to make a four minute film. It, it kind of, it, it's, it's that, whole Louis Kahn thing of asking a brick, what do you want to be? And the brick yeah. says, I want to be an arch. And you say, yeah. no, but we put a concrete lintel over it. We don't need to make it it's cheaper. And the brick says, I want to be an arch. This film doesn't want to be one of our classics, it's fine films. Um, it maybe wants to be it's something else. Maybe it's, maybe it's a series about rubber. Um, but, I, but I wonder about the, the, the development process. I mean, to get funding for the trip um, and then to manage the production and then to consider how it's distributed. I mean, um, please tell us a little bit about uh, your process there. Um, how yeah. you go from an idea to, you know, all of these various forms of output without a client. Um, because I believe <laughs> in your, your, your earlier work, right? There was no client. Yeah, so. no, there wasn't a client. Um, yeah, I'm going to switch slide. Oh, yeah, I'll switch this slide. Um, so basically, um, it's always like starting from the beginning when you go about getting funding because it's always different for each project. And, mm. and this one, we just, uh, it was from a mix of uh, London College of Fashion. They, uh, they um, sponsored the project and mm. um, we showed it there. Um, and that was fantastic. Um, also Winston Churchill Fellowship, they have like a, a fund where they fund travel for um, kind of social and, uh, issues and sustainable issues and, and it's like a charitable fund. Um, uh, yeah, at the moment, well, that's it at the moment. And then we got to, you know, WWF were very gracious in kind of helping us and um, really to take it to the next stage, we need to kind of go through all of that funding cycle again, because um, we've got plans for like how to kind of grow this whole project. Um, yeah. Do you, have, um, do, you are, do you have an example of any of your films that we'll see uh, as part of this presentation? Um, I, I don't have any clips of this Ford Langer film, if that's what you meant. Is it fun? or maybe the next project or? Oh uh, yeah. Um, I mean, we kind of, the films we very much do for um, uh, kind of adventure projects, but in 2017, we kind of did our first big immersive installation. Mm -hmm. And it was this um, new spring for COS in Milan. Um, I think this was the last time we saw each other in person at the opening. Yeah, <laughs> Milan is very much a thing of the past now, you know. Yeah, um, it's sad to say, but I think this this represents a very pivotal shift in in your work, right? Your earlier work, Definitely. 
Yeah, very different. So, so all of a sudden you're working with a brand and you have a kind of brief, I suppose. So what was Yeah, the... although, I mean, they, they're very, because of, uh, didn't really give us a, a brief, it's very much like carte blanche. Um, they gave us a venue and mm -hmm. an opportunity as it were. And we proposed, you know, this um, to them. Um, and um, uh, yeah, it, I mean, it's in this old cinema um, and we wanted to make kind of uh, kind of moment in the Milan Design Week. We, we um, wanted to kind of create something that would um, be kind of exist there, but then be able to all be taken down and go somewhere else and be tourable. Um, that wasn't just using a lot of resources to make something that would be on for a week and then thrown away. And so bubbles are kind of nice kind of symbol of that because they're obviously just ephemeral and they just disappear. Um, and so this was like us using technology. Um, and it, I think the shift is that we used to kind of, we're always interested in making worlds and immersive worlds. And before we were doing that with film and then we were make, doing it with real spaces. And so this is us kind of thinking about how to make a cinematic kind of moment, you're, but it's actually in a physical experience rather than in a film. Hmm. Um, so you're, you're in a way, you're kind of reverse engineering the, the feeling that you would have of watching a film, um, but producing the object first. Yeah. I mean, we're always really interested in like films that um, that kind of have these surreal qualities to them. And I think that there's something slightly surreal about, you know, going to sea and making a chair from plastic, synthetic material, you fish from the ocean. And there's something surreal about the different forms that we've made um, in, in that sense. Um, and, uh, is questioning what our future could be like. And I, I think that we wanted to make a experience that was out of the everyday and that was kind of surreal. Um, and that's why we really like how the, uh, we kind of looked for the right carpet that didn't pop the bubbles that kind of kept them like these fruit on the floor, which is kind of certainly unreal. And So was, um, that, a, was that a textile that costs uh, shared with you or, or, or is, it, is it just a kind of, a very soft carpet <laughs> or a very just soft a cheap pillow. office carpet. It, it was one of those fantastic <laughs> things where the cheapest carpet happened to be the absolute best um, <laughs> at retaining bubbles. <laughs> and so um, it was just a kind of, yeah, uh, carpet. It wasn't um, a cause material. Can you, do we have any images with people just to get a sense of scale? Yeah, there's actually a shadowy character in the, <laughs> in the left of that screen. Um, it's like seven meters high. Uh, right. the, the bubbles are the size of kind of large grapefruit. Um, oh, where, where were we? So, uh, so they're not really, this is when it went to Shanghai and we kind of, for the film, we brought in a kind of reflective pool into the space because we're interested in Chinese gardens and mm. that whole kind of floating world. Mm. I mean, with, with a company like Cost, of course, we see what they get in return. But then when I look at this and compare it to your earlier work, I mean, I'm thinking about Hair Highway, or sorry, um, was it called Hair Highway? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm thinking about Hair Highway, I'm thinking about Can City, I'm thinking about Fordlandia, and I'm thinking about the ways, um, you know, what's left behind, what returns to those people, what happens with that community of rubber tappers, for example, um, you know, it, it's, it could be perceived, uh, I guess, as uh, extractive or even indifferent, you know, to, to kind of go and document and make obviously a beautiful work of, of uh, journalism, design journalism in a sense and beautiful products. But, but I wonder how um, your studio engages in a kind of reciprocal development with these communities that you're working in. Yeah, I mean, that's, I'd say that's the hardest thing. It's easy to come up with an idea and then to make that idea beautiful and, and you know, um, but the hardest thing is to actually like, how does it generate real change? Um, and it's something that, um, that it, it, 
like with Can City, for example, we were kind of there studying for a long time um, at Catadors, which are like the waste collectors and wow. how they worked, interviewed them and, and then came up with this idea of the furnace and the furnace was made all with scrap materials from uh, in, a, in a kind of um, salvage dump with an old beer keg and all, all these kind of things and very low cost and then it made this foundry that they could you know that you could raise the value of the metal you're collecting um but it, it's far from being like uh i mean it would take i think it would take us 10 years of just doing that project to really make that a reality we left the furnace there with them um and show, uh, and train them how to use it and everything, but it's not something that is easy. It's like, oh, well, that's easy. That's done. Yeah, of um, course. You, you also offered the furnace online, right, as open source? Oh, that was for C-Chair, yeah. C-Chair was like, how can we generate change? We couldn't find any kind of um, uh, companies to make the chair or to work with it. And so we um, ended up thinking, well, the best thing would be that people are really excited about it they want to make their own they can kind of download the instructions to make their own furnace and to collect because the best way to collect sea plastic is actually from the beach um right. Right. the beach sorts and collects thousands of square kilometers of ocean for you and it brings it to the beach kind of dumps it in like neat right. relatively like small places um this is one of the learnings of your trip out to sea yeah <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Of, course, of course absolutely it's so it made me uh, really convinced that to try and try and collect it from the middle of the ocean mm. with the technology that we have is uh just not um it's just not the smartest way by a long way um it's so broken up into kind of micro confetti by then mm. and it's so spread out and it's just it it makes so much sense to collect it from the beach or to collect it from rivers before it gets to sea when it's still large objects that can be recognized and fished out and all these kind of things. Um, do, you find, do you find that, I mean, today we have such an emphasis on um, doing good or being of service or having a cause that, that design that is cause driven kind of dominates uh, the, the, the collective consciousness in a sense. I mean, how I think, you know, for the next generation, um, they're all asking, what does it do for me? Or what, is it, what does it do for, for us, let's say? Yeah. What does it do for the climate? What does it do for the planet? So do you feel, um, I guess, a responsibility or, you know, in terms of your mission going forward, now that you've, you've done 10 years of, of very um, interesting work, very, in some uh, fashion scholarly work, right? Um, really firsthand research uh, around the materials, around the processes, around the communities that are involved in, in the making of certain things. Um, and now you're at this kind of junction where you're, you're, you're working for brands and you're developing um, content, uh, essentially experiential um, environments and, and, and marketing. Uh, how do you reconcile those two kind of chapters in, in your studio's work? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I'd say well, with cause actually, they're, they're hugely interested in um, sustainability and materials. And um, the reason why they actually started the conversation with us in the first place is because they were big fans of sea chair and then they were, and then they really liked ford langer and they invited us in to kind of talk to them and and i think when they first started those conversations with us they were probably looking for those kind of projects that we'd been doing where we'd been looking at sustainable materials and if you look at um people they've commissioned since um uh, like the 3d printing plastic by arthur Mann, um they um, they are really interested in sustainability and how they can make their industry sustainable, which is exactly what we're interested in, is how, you know, how can you kind of take culture and, and nature and kind of find symbiotic relationships. Um, mm. And so I think that for us, it didn't feel like a kind of um, conflicting things to deal with, actually. It felt like part of the same uh, vision that we have going forward we want 
to be part of the conversation with industry and brands because that's not going away and we don't want to be just like um monks yeah, <laughs> yeah um, i mean it's a, it's a fine line to walk right to have yeah. that relationship with industry but then to also influence industry um, yeah. moving in the right direction yeah and i'd say that i think that our work has been you know the the impact of it would have been more on um contributing to ideas and possibilities and and kind of the imagination rather than um you know i can't I haven't even made a dent in the amount of sea plastic in the ocean that's just not but if i if we'd gone out with that goal then prob it's quite paralyzing because if you try and like okay we're going to go and solve this huge problem that's made by thousands of different factors huge complexity we're going to solve it. it it you'll end up doing nothing because um you mm -hmm. can't solve it with one thing you need it's take it's thousands and thousands of things that contribute to the well, problem it's, it's going to take yeah, thousands of systemic, yeah a systemic problem of course um yeah and i'd say that the major shift that we've seen and i hope we've contributed to is that when we were at college you know there's this idea that sustainable design was a different um it was a different genre of design um it's like oh you're interested in sustainability oh good you're interested in something out you know um whatever it and it was very niche and would actually um you know it was also something that was maybe not cool and something that was uh sometimes derided or, or looked down on and, and and i think that we always felt that um that sustainability needed desire and that that's the role that designers could play in that and um you know it needs people to be interested in it and you know we're not going to get anywhere if we kind of make people feel lectured or make them feel guilty right. we need to make them want it and hmm. you know you look at industries and you look at like the iphone and how everyone's got an iphone or whatever and you're you know that's built on by great design by you know um desire is the greatest agent of change always say so yeah. we kind of felt there was a there was a few things about sea plastic out there but there was nothing beautiful that you actually wanted to watch i mean i'm interested in sea plastic but i can't watch a kind of 40 minute documentary that's super depressing really like not beautifully shot i just can't life's too short i just that is painful um <laughs> so we wanted to make something that's kind of beautiful and poetic and like you know the chair itself is not like um a kind of aesthetic masterpiece it was more about like the focus on that was like the film and the story and the idea and i think that really resonated with people and yeah. kind of got the it's uh millions it's, of views it's really interesting how you know you 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 described almost being placed in the sustainability camp but but looking at your work right we that's the last thing i think about is is sustainability in a sense i think about I think about the 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 story. I think about the narrative. I think about the kind of arc of of development or the way that man interacts with the natural world and in in a lot of ways, of course, abuses it. But 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 also finds. Um, I mean, as you two are the main protagonists in your films, right? Finds uh, a way of working with it, um, which is you know quite unique and and. And then, of course, creates desire. So, um, yeah, Alex, we're 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 almost out of time. That's I can't problem. believe it. <laughs> it's been a really nice discussion, man. I, I'm I'm uh, I, I have to admit, although we we only saw two projects, I think we covered quite a lot of territory. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I, we, of course, this is. Uh, uh, pre-recorded uh, <laughs> and so we won't have any questions but I, I did have I did have a few questions that I just asked to friends and I just wondered can we take can we take a couple of minutes to ask a couple of questions um, let me see a couple of questions more that aren't necessarily mine let me see I'm going through my notes here um, let's see so I don't know. I mean, in a lot of ways, we, we've, we've already answered <laughs> many of these. <laughs> um, let's see, where's the last one? 
you know, I, this, this is actually one of my questions. I was, I was writing, as I was looking at your work, I was thinking about the two ways that, um, you know, we see the world operating today, right? Mm -hmm. There's the kind of product culture, those of us that are involved in, in making things um, that uh, may not be considering the image as a kind of primary driver for creative development, right? Um, making for making sake in a sense, making to produce product to kind of feed um, all of our dreams and desires, right? And then, you know, more recently with the invention of Instagram, of course, we've seen um, the development of content uh, and the importance of content, not just in brand building, but in the building of individual brands, right? The individual as a brand, the yeah. marketing of oneself and one story through a set of images. And, um, you know, I have a feeling after looking at your work and understanding your, your way of working that you're looking for a third way. And the third way um, combines both of those. Um, I wonder, do you, do you feel, um, I mean, how would you, not to say that you would package it that way, but, but how would you describe that third way? Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Um, I don't know if I, I could describe it yet actually, but I think that definitely, and the kind of people that I follow, I think maybe fall into that, they wouldn't be necessarily seen as designers, but they'd be seen as like people that could, um, show you ways of living mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and yeah I think that it it's really fascinating how it opens up um, ways of operating um, how would I define that third way I don't actually know I think, yet. I think ways of living pretty much <laughs> yeah I'd see that's basically. really an interesting perspective uh, <laughs> ways of living as opposed to ways to only make things or ways to yeah. really generate an image right yeah. So, yeah absolutely i mean i see design as the kind of art of life or art of living and i kind of yeah i think that encompasses it could, could in, can encompass anything like mental health physical health nutrition or whatever that is and you know um there's huge potential and there's huge um kind of pitfalls and dangers with um, like some of these things and with influencers and just going like all out on consumerism or all out on unattainable aspirations and that, but there is actually a, like a huge kind of, there's a pot of gold somewhere. There's a, there's a, there's something which can really help humanity and all of us as well. Yeah. If we, if we think about the art of living as opposed to um, making and, uh, let's say taking, <laughs> for yeah, example. <laughs> exactly. And I'm yeah. sure you've read like In Praise of Shadows and in a way that, is, that mm -hmm. book is about the art of living and, and that's as much to do with how you see the world around you. And I think designers can, and artists and can, scientists can all shift your perception of the world around you. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good place to leave it, Alex. Hey, listen, uh, thank you so much. Um, please give our best to Azusa. And uh, I'm a Chan. <laughs> I hope to see you guys soon. Yeah, I hope to see you in person. Yeah, somewhere in the world. Um, I, I love Tokyo and I, I hope to visit soon. And if you're ever in New York, please uh, look at Fantastic. Up. All right. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, we'll be in touch.